it's really kind of impossible to fully capture why humans act the way they do. And then if you're a health promoter, it's even more difficult to figure out, you know, how are people, what's going to help people change what they currently do in a way that promotes their health. And if you're sifting through the health promotion literature and you are trying to decide like what's the optimal way to run a program for my population, you're probably not going to get a nice, clean answer. And it can be very overwhelming to do health promotion work, which is why it's so important to have some sort of like logic framework, logic model to help us think through how do we actually develop a health promotion initiative? How do we run it? Or what does it actually look like? How do we structure it? How do we implement it? And then how do we run it and evaluate it properly? So it actually is doing, <laughs> you know, making a change, making an impact in people's lives the way we would like it to, to have. So that's what this very key model that we're going to be keep referring to all semester. That's why we talk about this pre-seed, proceed model. It is a logic model. It's a like thinking through your process model. And it involves what we call a participatory process. It's really about involving your population of interest in the development of a health promotion initiative that actually speaks to their values and their needs and their circumstances. And that's actually going to like be valuable to them and wanted by them and actually be successful for them as well. And it's been around for quite some time. It was developed uh, originally by this lovely man uh, named Lawrence or Larry Green, one of the, the big, uh, the big mover and shakers in the health promotion world, not only in Canada and the United States, he's worked at Johns Hopkins, UC Berkeley, at Harvard. And so the latest uh, overview of this model can be found in this 2023 uh, edition of Health Program Planning, Implementation, and Evaluation. And if you are watching, this is not part of my class, and this is something you're interested in, I really, uh, I really recommend picking up a copy. But for our purposes, I want to spend this time uh, going through the pre-seed, proceed model. And like I said, it's a logical mo logic model. You go through each phase of the model in order to get us to actually running the program and then evaluating the program. So what we do with the pre-seed, mo proceed model is first we pre-seed, we, before we do anything, we start working their population, figuring out our population, getting to know our population. What do they want? What do they value? What's going on with their health? Why is that going on with the health? What are some things that are causing those things to occur with their behaviors and their health? And then figuring out what kind of intervention strategy is going to speak to those things that we just figured out. And then we decide on what we're going to do. We decide on how we're going to roll it out. And then we decide on how we're going to evaluate it. And it's, I should mention, it's an iterative pro process as well, where you're like learning and adapting at each stage to ideally roll out a health promotion program that's, yes, based on evidence, but that's, yes, also tailored to your population, and that ideally has the greatest chance for success as well. And ideally, if you learn some really good things from rolling out your program, you can publish some research on that so other people can learn from your program, and we can do a lot of good in a lot of different places. Okay, so like I mentioned, with this model, first you precede. Before you do anything, there's the preceding part of the model, right? And precede stands for predisposing, reinforcing, enabling constructs in educational, epidemiological, ecological diagnosis and evaluation. Quite the mouthful. <laughs> but basically, what we're doing here is we're assessing and diagnosing, we're getting to know our population. We're engaging with them, we're asking them questions, we're doing epidemiological research on them, we're, we're collecting the research that's already been done on this population or similar populations. We're figuring out like why are they acting the way they're acting and you know what do they value that might help us like make changes in things that, that they value and that ideally will promote their health. Right. So in this precede part, we're figuring out like what's the ultimate goal, right? How do we get there and how do we foster an environment that's going to support those changes? 
and that is actually going to be meaningful to that population. And what you're, what's going to be a key theme in the pre-seed proceed model is this concept of evaluation. We want to like we want to keep track of everything we do and evaluate everything we do so we can keep like making our program better and better. And later on, evaluation is going to be really important for like figuring out if if what we did was meaningful, if there was success, if like it's worth doing again, if it's worth scaling up, if it's worth changing some things, right? So, but before we get there, we have to precede. And then once we've collected all that information in proceed, it's all about figuring out how you're actually going to roll it out, right? What you're actually going to do, what's going to be your intervention strategy, and then what does it look like logistically? How are you actually going to roll it out to make sure that you are as successful as possible? And then how are you going to evaluate it? So what I'm going to do is go through each each one of these different stages to give you a better understanding of what they mean. Okay, so the first stage is really about like you gotta you gotta engage with your population. You gotta get to know them. You gotta get to know like what's valuable to them. And not just like I wanna exercise more. That's not like if they, someone tells you I wanna exercise more, that's actually not what's valuable to them. Like why? What is actually that they're truly seeking? Right? And maybe what they're truly seeking is connection to their social social group. And they think that if they exercise more, they'll feel more connected to their social group or they'll increase in confidence and feel more connected. Or maybe they feel that because they're not healthy in certain ways, their work is suffering. And because their work is suffering, that's affecting their like economic bottom line. And that's really important to them because, you know, they want to be successful. They want to provide for their family. They have these higher level values. It's like, what is the cultural values of your population, right? What are their higher level desires, right? Do they want to become a better parent, more attractive, more independent, right? You want to like ask questions and build these connections and try to establish like what are these like higher level goal states because then you can like understand a little bit more about who these people really are and what's actually going to motivate their change, right? And I love this, 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 term right here health for what purpose exercise for the sake of exercise is that what why we're promoting it lowered obesity rates for the sake of lowered obesity rates yeah that's great but like why do we want that right what is valuable truly to those people and that knowing that is really going to help us inform you know how we're going to roll it out and maybe how we're going to market it as well right and and ideally bring it back to those people and do something that meaningful to the people that um, we're working with okay so now that you know like what are these people really about and what do they really value and like what's this higher level goal state that they want to get to then we start figuring out a little bit more about like what's well what's currently going on right so their higher level goal state is they want to be more attractive sure or they want to make more money sure well what's happening right now like if we're talking about like they don't want to miss as much work. Well, what's absenteeism right now? What's um, and how is absenteeism being linked to um, you know potential disease states that they have? You know, mortality and morbidity rates in that population. We can talk about disability, fitness, morbidity, mortality, physiological risk factors. These are all things. This is like. A little bit more consulting the research but also asking our population questions about like what's currently going on with your health right um, so we want to identify like the various genetic behavioral and environmental factors that are currently affecting those people's health right and this is going to help us determine priorities so what is the problem according to whom who has the problem what do those with the problem, why do those people with the problem have it, and what are we going to do about it? That's kind of moving into the later stages. And how do we know that what we decide to do is going to be effective? It's a little bit more moving into some of the later stages, but it's still some of the things we want to think about in this epidemiological assessment stage. And in phase three, is like, okay, we know how much this population is exercising. We know how that's affecting their health. We know how that's affecting their like higher level values. Okay, so they're not exercising a lot. That's like what's going on, but why? Phase three is really about the why. Why aren't they exercising enough? 
right? Why aren't they moving their body enough? Why are they currently smoking? Why are they eating a certain way? What are the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors that are causing that current behavior or that current environment to exist, okay? So let's break this down a little bit further because that's this is such an important part of the diagnostic stage. So predisposing factors, okay, so they're not exercising, why? What predisposing factors is like what's happening before like before the behavior actually starts. So what I mean by that, like what's previously existing that's affecting that behavior? So we're talking like beliefs, values, skills, your genetics is a predisposing factor as well. What's gone on before with their level of physical activity? Maybe they had terrible experiences. Maybe everyone in your population went to a school where like physical activity was seen as a punishment and they have a really negative attitude about it, right? So what are these things, some changeable, some not changeable, that are predisposing people to engage in a behavior or not engage in a behavior? Okay, so these are things that exist within an individual and we can play with them a little bit. Once we know what they are, we can then maybe make a difference in them, but we need to know what they are first. Okay, reinforcing factors. These are things that affect a behavior like after the behavior has taken place. Okay, so presupposing factor is like, do I like exercise? Do I value exercise? Do I know how to exercise? Uh, did I have a ha pa bad past experience with exercise? Do I have a mobility issue? That's a predisposing factor. Reinforcing factors like, okay, well, I've started to exercise. What can reinforce that behavior? What can keep it happening? Okay, so um, when you start to exercise, a reinforcing factor can be like how good you feel. <laughs> it can be how your fitness goes up. It could be that you like post it on social media and someone gives you a like about it. So reinforcing factors, they help a behavior to keep taking place. Okay, and then an enabling factor, this is something that allows the behavior to take place. Okay, so it's like it's a kind of like a support system for the behavior so there are barriers opportunities created by society people that make it harder or easier for people to change okay so policies laws like buildings accessibility to these buildings so for instance if we're using the example of exercise again okay predisposing factor is like do i like exercise do i want to exercise do i value it do i know how to blah 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 reinforcing exercise uh, value reinforcing factor for exercise is like when i exercise what feedback do i get that makes me want to keep doing it and then an enabling factor is like what's there to help me actually do it right so for exercise it could be is there a gym nearby is that gym too cost prohibitive um, do I have the right uh, skills? Sometimes skills are an important part of this as well. Like, is there a place where I could learn the skills right there that is going to help me actually participate in that? So another example would be like, that kind of brings these three factors together is like, if you want people to like pick up after their dogs. <laughs> if people aren't picking up after their dogs, there's predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors that's leading to that. A predisposing factor is like, do they want to pick up after the dog? Do they value it? Do they know that they should? Do they know how to do it? Do they know where to buy the bags? Right, that's a predisposing factor. A reinforcing factor is that like, if you don't pick up after your dog, people will give you dirty looks. <laughs> or maybe there's like a fine if you don't pick up after your dog, right? Or you do pick up after your dog and you feel good about it. Okay, that's a reinforcing factor. An enabling factor is like, do the supports exist that help you to do that? So are there doggy bags available at the park? Are there garbages nearby? Or are the garbages really spread apart? So for instance, if I pick up after a dog and I have to hold the doggy bag for like five kilometers, that doesn't enable me to make better decisions, okay? So in this stage, phase three is such a key stage. It's like what's leading to the behavior and we're breaking them into these three categories to help us better understand that behavior. And once we successfully assess what are the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors that are leading to that behavior, then we can start prioritizing like, okay, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna roll up my intervention by focusing on building up, changing people's values around exercise. And I also wanna make it, 
make it so they know where to go to exercise and they have access to a gym nearby enabling factor. And I'm also going to set up a program where when they go to the gym to exercise, they get a stamp and they collect 10 stamps and they they get a prize. I don't know, right? That's a reinforcing factor. Now, this isn't the best example, but it gives you an example of how we can start now that we know the reinforcing the predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors that lead to a health behavior, then we can start thinking about how do we actually use those to build our program, which is stage four, right? In stage four, phase four, that's where I kind of group them together, stage four and five, because this right here is where we switch from like, okay, we've done the diagnosis, we understand our population, and now what are we gonna do? What are we actually gonna roll out? How are we going to roll it out? So what are we actually going to roll out? How are we going to roll out? And how are we going to make sure that it made a difference, right? We're going to match the priorities established in steps one to three with realistic strategies for change, okay? So now we're going to start actually doing it. That is the phase four and phase five. And I want to further divide it up. I want to talk about each of these sub parts of four and five um, independently. So when you're deciding on your intervention, there's so many different things you can actually do. And chances are you're going to use for like a really good health promotion initiative, you're probably focusing on changing some predisposing factors, enabling factors, and reinforcing factors, all of which combine to promote that behavior change that is that helps to change that higher level health thing <laughs> that ideally is linked to a higher level value that that group wants, right? That was the pre seed part. Okay. So in the intervention, it's like, okay, I know my population, I know what they're about, I know why they're doing what they're doing right now, so what's actually going to make a difference? What have others done? What was successful? What does the evidence suggest will work? You're probably not going to find evidence that speaks directly to your specific population under these circumstances, but people have done other things in other populations. Can we learn from those? How can you tailor your intervention to your people? right? And are there theories we need to ground in as well? And there's lots of health promotion theories that we discuss in this class that can help ground our, our health promotion program, like behavior change theories, right? Might help ground our program. And we want to adapt our intervention to the specific um, people. So intervention is like, what are we going to do? Like, what's what are the components of our program? And honestly, there's so many different things. So I just, I really want to just quickly put up this slide because I thought it was so effective at giving you different ideas for pre, for interventions that can speak to predisposing factors, reinforcing factors, and enabling factors as well, right? So when it comes to predisposing factors, if you want to change some of the predisposing factors, depending what they are, you might choose to use one-on-one -on -one communicate uh, education, motivational interviewing, which we'll talk about in this class, role modeling. There's a lot of different things you can do. Reinforcing Factors, intervention strategies might include like trying to change the social norms around that particular activity, right? So like maybe we change the social norms around physical activity. So it means like if you exercise, that means you're cool. So then when you exercise, you're like, well, that means I'm cool, right? So that's a way to change like one of those. And then enabling factors, there's a bunch of different intervention strategies there as well to give you some things to think about. But again, the book might give you more to think about. Okay, so you've decided what you're going to do. Okay, but what does it actually look like in practice? How are you actually going to implement it? And there's a huge push these days in health promotion to really talk about like implementation research. Like how do you roll this program out? Who do you have to train? What resources do you need? What resources do you have? How do you maximize those resources? How do you minimize costs? How much are you going to charge people? Right? There's a lot of things to, to think about. Right? So you want to assess what you need, assess what you have, and what is going to help or hinder your ability to actually roll out this program. So key questions, what will happen and when? Do you need some sort of timeline that you want to organize? Do you need to hire people? Do you need to recruit people? Do you need to train people? Do you need to get certain people on board because they're potentially gatekeepers to your population? Like, how are you going to pay for this thing? <laughs> how are you going to pay for it so you can keep rolling it out? Are you going to charge something? And ideally, you charge something in a way where it's very nominal, very minimal. So it's not just like rich people that can afford it. You want to keep uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion in mind. 
And then you also want to think about with your implementation, like how are you actually going to monitor the whole thing and how are you going to make sure it rolls out properly? So parts of an implementation plan might include like a logic model, like first we're going to do this. Well, I'm going to do this. They're going to do this. They're going to do this. Next stage, I'm going to do this. They're going to do this. These other people are going to do this. This is how we're going to roll it out. These are the elements of it. And this is like maybe the timeline, but also like what gets done at each part of the timeline and who does what as well. Maybe you need like a training model or an implementation model. You probably need a budget <laughs> to make sure it's, it's economically feasible too. Okay. We've preceded. We did an amazing job preceding, understanding our population, figuring out what actually is valuable to them, what's going on with their health, what like behaviors and environmental factors are leading to that like health issue, and then why? Why are they actually doing acting that way currently? And how can we play with the why? to figure out what we're actually going to do. And now we've decided what we're going to do, we've decided how we're going to roll it out, and now evaluate, 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 evaluate it, right? You are accountable to the people that are doing your program. You're accountable to the people that funded the program. You are accountable to the organizations whose time and resources you're asking for, right? You want to know if it was successful, what worked, and, and like, what do we value as an outcome? What is an acceptable change in that particular thing we value? And there's really kind of two main parts to this like style of evaluation. First part was what we call process evaluation, where process evaluation is like, did we do what we said we were going to do? I said I was going to run this fitness program on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays from 930 to 1130. Did I? That's process evaluation. Did I send out flyers? Did I post on social media? Did I um, develop this marketing campaign? Did I do that process evaluation? And if I didn't, why? Maybe you want to log all that. That's process evaluation. But then phase six to eight is like, how do people respond? Did it change behavior? Did people change? Did that health factor change? And ideally, did that like higher level value of, of theirs get like supported and ideally get better for that person population okay so there's so much to be said about evaluation you can, oh my gosh i don't even know where to begin i can't believe i'm doing all of this in one video but anyways <laughs> i was just talking about process evaluation and this kind of gives you a timeline of like when it should be done what it helps to demonstrate and why we do it process evaluation like i said this is did we do what we said we were going to do Right. And so we want to evaluate that while we're doing it and like figure out what we want to evaluate for our process evaluation as we're developing our program. And then short term and intermediate outcome evaluation. This is going to happen after the program's also already started to run. And it's a little bit about like how many people showed up? How did they respond? Did they like it? Did they change their behavior? Did they come a lot in the beginning, but they dropped off at the end? right? The extent to which the program is having an effect on the target population and their attitudes, knowledge, and behavior, right? And then more longer term is like at the end of your program is when you're going to run this. And that's like, did it have those, like, did it affect that higher level goal, right? And did it make a difference in these people, right? And what they was truly valuable to them. Probably want to do an economic evaluation as well. Like how much money did it cost? Were we using resources properly? Was this program cost effective? Okay. How do you evaluate? Oh my God, that's another video too. That's so much we can pop, we can talk about, but mixed methods is usually the way we do it in health promotion. A little bit of quantitative, a little bit of qualitative. We kind of mix different quantitative and qualitative styles together to figure out like what's going to be best for our particular program and at that particular stage of the program. I'm not going to get into all this right now because it's just too much to talk about, <laughs> but it's really going to depend on your population, how you've designed it and what you're actually doing. Okay. So as far as to get a little bit more specific, though, as far as quantitative methods go, you might want to do surveys. That's what we usually do. Uh, logs, uh, registries or records, web use statistic, program documents. That's all more like numbery quantitative methods. But qualitative methods can give us such good information as well. Maybe we do some focus group. Maybe we like talk to the people that are running the program as well. 
maybe we do some concept mapping maybe we do some case studies maybe we get people to like draw out their experience or have like journals all of these can be really effective especially when we're like marketing our program after the fact or like like telling the people that gave us money <laughs> you know how effective it was so for this outcome or impact evaluation right we want to make sure to like notice if there's changes in the short term intermediate term and long term you might want to compare participants before and other after or you might want to compare them to a to a, a comparison group there's lots of different methods you can do to to help you with that something else worth collecting it information on is like did anything like come up that was unexpected as well. So to summarize, <laughs> health promotion work is complex because we're talking about humans, we're talking about human behavior, and we're talking about a huge literature base that it's hard to even know where to begin with. So the precede proceed model takes a bit of the guesswork out of developing a health promotion campaign by giving you this logic model, by giving you these kind of phases that you can work through, and they're not discrete, they overlap, but you work through these as you're building and rolling out and evaluating your health promotion initiative to make sure that you are maximizing the, the outcomes and delivering a program that your population actually wants, right? And so just to summarize the model one last time, First of all, we start by getting to know our population, what they really value, what's important to them, and what kind of health factors are going on with them that are affecting those like higher level values. We do this epidemiological assessment as well in phase two to figure out like what like genetic predispositions do they have because we need to know that. But more importantly, like what kind of behaviors or environmental factors are going into that health that's then affecting that higher level quality of life factor. And once we understand the behaviors of our, our, our population and the environment of our population, right, then we want to ask ourselves why in phase three. Why are they behaving this way? Why is the environment that way? Right? What is going on before they even decide to engage in the behavior that's affecting their desire to, to do it or not do it? What kind of things are happening that are making them want to continue being engaging that behavior or want to make them stop? What kind of feedback is going on? Is it reinforcing good behaviors or is it like making sure they don't happen, right? And how can we play with that? And then what kind of supports, what opportunities, what barriers exist that are going to enable or make it more difficult for people to actually engage in that behavior. And when we're thinking through this, and we're definitely engaging with our population to figure these things out, we're trying to think of like, okay, where can I make a difference? 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 And what would an amazing health promotion campaign, health promotion initiative looks like, look like that takes these predisposing, reinforcing, and enabling factors into account that speak to that higher, those higher level de desires of our population. And once we've figured that out and we've decided what an intervention might actually look like, we also really have to think about like, how is that like realistically going to roll out, right? What is it actually going to look like in practice? And how the heck are we going to evaluate it? How are we going to evaluate our own work to make sure we did what we said we were going to do? And then how are we going to evaluate how people responded to our program in the short term and whether it had an effect on their health or those bigger, higher level values that those people had, okay? So that's the pre pro -C model. That was a bit long-winded, but a lot to cover. And that's going to be really important to what we do in this class as far as you're going to build your own health promotion initiative using a lot of these constructs.